for whoever would love life and seize good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. They must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pure pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and the ears are attentive to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil, who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good. But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts, revere God as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. So be it. Can you hear me? Okay. Do you remember a few weeks ago, some of you weren't here, but do you remember a few weeks ago when I gave you the cotton balls? We passed something around. That's a no-no, but we did anyway. And I told you that on that day I played a little Roy Clark song, and some of you knew it, and some of you were like, Phew. But it was the Roy Clark song about picking cotton. And I said, on that day that Jesus isn't going to ask you how much you worked in this world doing the things of this world like picking cotton. He's going to ask you about how you fished for men. And that includes training them up when they're children. So yeah, I'm going to poke and prod you so that you hear the Holy Spirit telling you we have this, this ministry called Awana. We've got a community that wants to see and hear about our Jesus, and that's what we're here to talk about today. So let's start with prayer. Father in heaven, we do thank you and we praise you that you would send your one and only Son to die for us, that this was your plan from the very beginning, that you knew that this creation called man would betray you and sin against you, and you knew that it would cost the life of your Son that He would leave heaven and become the very thing that He created, that He would humble Himself, that He would be alone in this world, that He would have to answer and be raised by parents, His creation, and that He would have to walk a submissive life to you, empowered by the Spirit, and He'd have to even lay down that life for us. Not just give it up, but be spit upon, mocked, cursed, not even recognizable as a man. And He did that because of His love for us, because of Your love for us, because of Your great mercy. We just thank You and praise You. Help us not to take our salvation lightly, but to listen to the words of Jesus, to pattern our lives after Him, to be a new creation in Christ through the power of the Spirit. And may we shine individually and as a church in this community so that when that day does come, that we can be accountable and not ashamed, and that we could have made a difference in our community for Jesus. We pray this in His precious name. Amen. So if you don't know, we've been reading along this year. We've been reading a Bible plan that you read five days of the week. And then on Saturday, you reflect about what you read and everything. And then on Sunday, I kind of tie it all together. And Friday nights, we've been meeting for Bible study also and talking over these things. So you're welcome to come to that if you haven't been coming. That's at Chuck's house at 530. Um, you should have read this week, 2 John, 3 John, and then the first three chapters of Peter. And there's a reading schedule up here if you want one. Today, I'm going to... Skip on past John, and we're going to discuss a little bit of what we read in 1 Peter. You know, we've read most of the New Testament now, guys. We've got the book of John and Revelation, and maybe something else. I haven't looked at the calendars to go is all we've got. 
you're doing great. And most everybody's reading along and getting involved in it. And if you don't know, I'm doing podcasts through the week. Some of them are short enough for Kim to not have to sit down, and other ones are long enough she has to sit down and find a comfortable spot. <laughs> you never know with me. Sherry bought me this watch, and, and it's arm candy to me. I don't pay, use it for time. <laughs> it's whatever the Lord gives me. I don't have anything written down today either. Oh, so you know that means it might be a long time. So turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 3, and let's look at what we read this week. And it's not coincidence that we read it this week, going into Awanas. Just like it wasn't coincidence when we read Timothy, when we started talking and preparing for Awana. And I know a lot of you have a lot of apprehension and questions, and, and you just don't know. But, you know... Peter had no idea that day that he was going to step out of the boat and walk on water. And his disciples that day said, you fell down. But Peter said, I walked on water. And what's even better is Jesus said, Peter, you walked on water. Because you stepped out in faith. You didn't worry about, how am I going to do this? Am I equipped? Anything else? You just said, I love Jesus, and wherever he's at, I want to be there also. 1 Peter chapter 1, I'm reading from the New Century Version, and I'm just going to be kind of going along, but I will tell you what verses I am, just to give you a review of what we read. This uh, letter is written by Peter, one of the twelve apostles. It's written probably 25 years or so before John wrote his first and second and third letters. John is writing to people who are suffering, people who are uh, being plagued by false prophets. They claim to be from God, but they're not. Same thing that's going on in Timothy and the other letters, and that's why you need to study to be an approved workman so that on that day you won't be ashamed because you can rightly handle the word of truth. You can tell the truth of God from a lie. And you have to be able to do that if you're going to teach and train. And if you're going to fish for people, you have to fish. That means you have to stop what else you're doing and then fish. A few weeks ago, Sherry and I just stopped what we were doing and we went and fished. And I had no idea that day there would not be a store one on Dorshack Reservoir that had that was open, that had worms. There's a little store there. There's only one. There's, there's nothing else on the lake. But we get to that store, and it's closed. So she had no worms to fish with. She likes a bobber and a, a hook with a barb on it <laughs> and a worm. So she had to learn to fish with, a, I had a little Zebco 33 with that little kit that comes in it. That's it. And do you know what happened that day? She caught fish. That's not how she prepared to fish that day by any means. But it's what she had that day. And she fished and she caught fish. And Barry was saying earlier we needed men. And he has fished. Well, I had a guy come into my life and you, most of you know him here. He worked for me and he came to church here. His name was John. And he had two boys that hadn't been brought up in church whatsoever. And one of the two of them made a profession of faith in Awana under Barry Pauls. Because he was willing to fish. You just need to be willing to step out of the boat and then just watch how far you can walk on water. Remember to fix your eyes on Jesus. Don't take your eyes off Him. Trust in Him. And here's where we're at in Peter. Peter's writing this letter, like I said, 20, 25 years, 30 years before John. This is when the persecution is really starting. And Peter's writing this letter, as we're going to see in just a second, to those that are scattered abroad because they are being persecuted. They have been taken from their homes, everything else. And maybe that's a good thing because maybe now they're not going to work for these other things. Maybe they can think about the gospel, the Great Commission. Maybe they can think about the fact that Jesus Christ is returning soon and He is going to ask them how they fished, plain and simple.
but they're scattered abroad, and Peter's writing this because suffering is going to come. And we have an opportunity right now where the worst thing we're suffering about is apprehension because we don't know what's going on in the world around us. That's really it. There are places all over the world that they suffer each and every day, that they don't know what they're going to eat, whether they're going to live or die that day. And if they profess the name of Jesus Christ, there's a better chance they won't live through that day. And all we've got to worry about is if we're going to offend somebody and how we're going to do it. When the opportunity is probably one of the greatest times we've had in this country to spread the gospel message. If we'll just fish for men with whatever we have in our little tackle box. And I'm going to tell you what, this church has a lot to offer in its tackle box because there are a lot of talented, loving individuals that know Jesus Christ. And all you've got to do is share that hope, which we're going to get to in just a minute, that you have in you when that opportunity comes. Peter didn't know at that time, but he's being led by the Holy Spirit that he would be crucified just a few years later for his faith. And he's telling these exiles that are scattered abroad, living as aliens in the world, which we're called to do, that they need to be prepared for suffering. They don't need to fear. They need to live a life that shows they're Christians so that when the opportunity is given to them, they can tell others about Jesus. So in 1 Peter 1, verse 1, we see that it's from Peter. It's to God's chosen people or elect people, those that belong to God. They're away from their homes and scattered all abroad, all throughout what we call modern-day Turkey now, some of the same audience that we see Paul writing to and John writing to. These are God's holy people that do what they do through the Spirit's power and work if they obey Him so they may be cleaned by the blood of Jesus Christ. Verse 3, we have this living hope. Praise be to God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In God's great mercy, He has caused us to be born again into a living hope. Right there, that's enough for you to go out and tell people about Jesus. When you die, you will spend eternity with God in a place that has no more sin, no more suffering, you don't even need sunshine because the light of Jesus will light up everything. Boy, that's something worth talking about. This is kept for you in heaven, verse 4. Verse 5, God's power protects you through your faith until salvation is shown to you at the end of time. Why do we not want to do certain things? Like, let's say, teaching Awana or helping Awana. It's a bad four-letter word. It starts with F. Thank you. E-A-R. Fear. I'm afraid I can't walk on water. I'm afraid I can't catch anything with this Zebco 33 little grub kit that I've never used before. What color should I use? How do you even put them on the hook right? How do you make that action right where that fish will bite? Or just throw it out there and just hope and some fish will take it, won't he? I have called you, Jesus said, to be fishers of men. Come and follow after me. Dute o piso mu, if I pronounced it right. My, my foreign language skills aren't that great. It means forsake everything else and come and follow after me. Forsake everything else to deny yourself, take up your cross and follow after Jesus. You can't fish unless you're willing to do it. God's power protects you through your faith. We're not being persecuted to death. We just might be inconvenienced a little to give up Wednesday night and maybe another night to prepare and maybe some other time to pray. God will protect us. We will get everything done. He will keep us until that day when salvation comes. Verse 6, this makes you very happy, even though now for a short time different kind of troubles make you sad. I've got to give up a night or two. But these troubles come. These are light momentary troubles for sure. 
Verse 7, to prove that your faith is pure. Verse 10, the prophets, they searched carefully for these things. They prophesied about the sufferings of Christ. Now, why are we switching to the sufferings of Christ? Because Christ suffered for us and calls us to give up whatever it is that we're holding on to, deny ourselves, to take up our cross, our instrument of suffering and pain, and follow after Jesus. I've got as busy a schedule as any of you. <laughs> I've got the church. I've got a business. I've got a home to sell and a home to move into. And like the other day, Rose said, are we going out to dinner tonight? And I said, I've got so many things to do. But I've got a Rose that says she wants to go out to dinner tonight. And Sherry says, you know what we've got to do. We've got to get this stuff done and go pick up Rose. Because that was the most important thing on our schedule today, that day. The rest of the things would be fine. But brotherly love was what we needed to be concerned about that day. Wednesday at night, you need to be concerned about Awana. Verse 13. So prepare your minds for what? Service and have self-control. Don't be worried about all these other things. They'll take care of themselves. Jesus says not to even worry about what you eat or what you wear because your Father in Heaven knows that you need those things and He will provide them. And He's a much better Father than any earthly father that you can ever imagine. So you need to prepare your minds for service. What's important? What's important that I can do this school year? I can teach these little children. I can come along beside their parents and train them. I can be a loving, safe place that they can come to and be excited to hear about Jesus Christ in a world that doesn't want to hear about Him. Verse 17, You pray to God and you call Him Father, and He judges each person's work equally. Are you an approved worker that's not ashamed? And are you training up approved workmen that are not ashamed? So while you're here on earth, you should live with respect for God. Not worried about the things you've got to do. Respect for God. If Rose calls you up today and says she wants to go eat today, that needs to be where your love of God is, when the love of others. But you were saved from the useless life, the worthless life that you used to live, to live a new life. Verse 22, now that your obedience to the truth has purified your souls, you, you ha can have true love for your Christian brothers and sisters. So you love each other deeply with all your heart. We were made to be in a relationship with God and with others. It's fellowship. It's what we read about in John, about having fellowship with one another. We know that we are in fellowship with God because of the love that we have for our brothers and sisters. And all of these Awana families and children, they're part of our church. They may not come here. They may come here. But our church reaches wide past these doors that are here. They include every denomination, everyone who says that Jesus Christ is Lord. And we have a responsibility to them so that they can be responsible when they are trained up, so that they can fish for others. Deuteronomy tells us to talk about it when we get up, when we go to bed, when we're traveling along the road, when we sit down to eat, all day long to tell about the hope that we have to train up our children. Peter goes on to write at the end of that chapter that all people are like grass. The grass dies, the flowers fall. But the word of the Lord will live forever. That's why I hope you are reading your Bibles. I hope that's why you're studying your Bibles, to know the truth. Don't go by what I tell you up here or someone else says. Know God's word because you are reading and studying to be an approved workman who won't be ashamed on that day. Chapter 2. So then rid yourselves of all evil. As newborn babies, 
that want milk, you should crave spiritual milk, spiritual teachings. And these children are craving it, and they need someone to train them. It's not just your job, it's their parents' job, but they need you to come along aside, provide a place where they can come together, a safe environment, where they can see other trainers, where they can see other men of God that live. Oh, I don't know how many times that helped me to see a godly man somewhere else, not just a, the godly man I knew in my life. And my dad spent more time training me up how to be a good businessman, and I'm not condemning him, than he did training me up to be a good fisher of men. That was his mistake. It was my mistake as a parent also. But you know what? At any time you can pick up that tackle box and use whatever's in it and start fishing. It doesn't matter about the days that you went out prior to that. It matters about what you're doing today. Today is the day of salvation, each and every day. And God is counting on you to fish. But by it you can mature in your salvation by drinking this spiritual milk. Verse 4, come to the Lord Jesus, the stone that lives. So Peter changes over to a building. He says that Jesus Christ is the cornerstone and you are the building blocks. You can't be building a kingdom if you're not going out and fishing for men. The kingdom won't build any further. Oh yeah, someone else can do it though, right? But Jesus called all of you, if you're willing to be His disciple, to fish for men. To deny yourself, to take up your cross and follow after Jesus. And anyone who says that they're willing to do this and then takes their hand off of the plow to work is not worthy of the kingdom of heaven. You will suffer, don't be surprised, because your Lord and Savior suffered. And our suffering, I'm going to say it again, is very light and very momentary. I'm dropping down to verse 9. But you are a chosen people. You don't stumble over Jesus. You should be building your life upon Jesus. You are royal priests, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. So we covered fellowship, and now we're covering building, or fishing, or witnessing, or training up future disciples, everything that I could apply to Awana. At one time you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Verse 11, Dear friends, you are like foreigners and strangers in this world. I beg you to avoid the evil things that your bodies won't. These are exiles, these are strangers in the world that Peter is writing to. They had to give up their homes already for Jesus. What are they trying to do? They're trying to reestablish themselves on their throne, build their lives over again, instead of giving up their lives to follow after Jesus. Why are they doing that? Because they fear that God won't provide for them the things that they need, so they need to provide it for themselves. And the world is teaching them all this. So they're being distracted. They're taking their eyes off Jesus and missing the chance to fish in this foreign land that they're in. So Peter tells them to live as foreigners. They already are. They have every opportunity. In this time of COVID, we have a tremendous opportunity because there are so many apprehensive people and Satan is even dividing the churches. Wow, over it. Apprehensive people definitely need to hear about the joy that you have. And you can't tell them about the joy you have unless, number one, you're living a life of joy, and number two, you're telling about the life of joy. Verse 12, people who do not believe are living all around you, and they might say that you're doing wrong. But you live such good lives that they will see the good things you do and will glorify God. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven, right? And I'm quoting Bible verses from other places. You know what? I learned a lot of those in Awana. <laughs> then he gets into submission in chapter 3. Oh, boy. Amen. <laughs> Before we get there, who submitted first? 
Jesus. We're still there in chapter 2. Jesus submitted all the way to a horrific death, a humiliating death, a betrayed death. Even Peter, the, the one that would build the church, denied him three times. And each time that denial got worse to where he said basically, I swear to heaven, I don't know this Jesus. But he repented. He changed his way of thinking. Jesus reinstated him to fish for men. And that's what he did. So he tells us about Christ's example. And then he tells us about governments, believe it or not, that we should follow. Now let me tell you what governments they were following. I've got to put the audience there so you understand this. They were following an oppressive Roman Empire that did basically enslave all other nations. But because of this, there was a road system, there was one language where the gospel could spread. Wow! Imagine that. And we've already addressed that you should pay taxes unto whoever it is you to pay taxes to. Jesus submitted to Roman authority. Well, wait a minute. Roman authority now, because Peter's writing this letter, they're persecuting Christians. They're throwing them into the games to be sport, to be killed. They're just flat crucifying them left and right. They're using them as lampposts to light up the streets at night. And Peter's telling them to submit to this type of government because God is in control and you don't need to, what's the word, Debbie? Fear. Because we don't want to do what we don't want to do because we don't want to not be in control and we fear what might happen to us if we give up that control to God. So he goes on then next to say about slaves and their masters. And he's talking about slaves that need to be obedient, submissive, loving, respectable to masters who beat them persecute them because if they see your good loving kind deeds your faith your lack of fear it will glorify your father which is in heaven and who knows it might lead to their salvation okay now we're to chapter three see i was building you up first wives submit to your husbands and you got six verses about wives then verse 7 has got one about husbands. Okay, we're building on these things. Let's talk about the wives that were there in Peter's day. Okay? And let's also talk about this scripture because these husbands were unbelieving husbands. Okay? So how is an unbelieving husband going to treat his wife in the day of Peter? Like a piece of cattle. <laughs> Less than a piece of cattle because cattle has value. Women don't. And he's saying, be submissive, be loving and kind. Don't worry about what your outward appearance is. Worry about what's in here. Because this is what's beautiful. And this is what God looks at. He doesn't look at the appearance of man. He looks at the heart of man. The new heart that is given to you because of changed mind, because the Holy Spirit has come in and changed you, transformed you. And what do you do? You worship God in speech and in action. You train up others. So this wife is told to be submissive to this husband who will definitely cheat on her. He goes down to the pagan temple just to do that. Who will definitely tell her to keep her mouth shut about everything. Who will probably beat her. And Peter says, be submissive. Now, you want me to go further, go do the blog that I did on this one. Because <laughs> I'm not going to get all these things today. But today the divorce rate is as high in the church as it is outside the church. And the main reason, whether we want to go to abuse or anything else, is because I don't want this anymore. Whatever reasons put it there, I don't want this anymore. So then cheating does come up, so we can use that as a biblical example because we've been unfaithful. But many times it's not by the one who started the abuse. It's by the one who was receiving the abuse. 
And the world told them, you go for it, girl, or, you, or guy, you should do whatever. They've given them this other gospel. And if you remember, when we start, first started meeting from COVID, we happened to talk about the Good Samaritan. And one of the things I pointed out then, if you don't remember, was that the priest, he wouldn't even pay any attention to probably his fellow Jew that was laying in the ditch. Because it probably was, where this was at was probably a fellow Jew. The Levite, he at least went over and looked at it, but he said, this is too much trouble, too much time, going to cost me too much, whatever it is. And then the Samaritan went over and helped. And we always focus on that, the Good Samaritan. Let's be like the Good Samaritan. But see, the Good Samaritan was a Samaritan. He was a half-breed who did not know Jesus. He knew Jesus plus. He knew another Jesus. He knew whatever. So you get all these false doctrines out there that do go and tell about Jesus Christ, that do live a life of fear and trembling before the Lord, but teach a false gospel. And then they go out and help the world and love on the world. Who are they going to listen to? Us who sit in the pews and never say anything? Or us who judge others? Or those who are loving and kind? So that Samaritan, when he went back and visited that guy and says, let me tell you about the God of Israel and the God of the Canaanites that we blended together. That's the gospel message that person's going to hear. We don't need to be like the Samaritan. We need to be like the priest and Levite should have been because we are called to be a set-apart, holy people, a priest, the first one who wouldn't even look. We are called to be priests as though God was making His plea to people through us. So the first thing that means is you need to step out of the boat on Wednesday nights and come and work in Awana. And then we need to look for a lot more opportunities. Block parties for, for the, the people in our neighborhood, the people in your neighborhoods, whatever they are. But we've got to live a life. That's why we need to live this life that's submissive. So that even when we suffer for doing right, the world sees us, our Heavenly Father's proud of us, but our, the world sees us and says, what in the world, Merle, are you that way for? I've known a lot of Jesus people, and I'm using real examples. Because he's got a neighbor. Don't you tell me when he moved in. Don't you talk to me about Jesus. Because he's seen plenty of people that proclaim Jesus and don't live like Jesus. But just the other day, he asked Merle, he said, won't you tell me a little bit about this Jesus? Because he saw how Merle lived. Not the things he said, because Merle made sure he didn't say too much. He saw the way that he lived. Oh, let's go ahead and get there. Let's go, suffer. Let's go there to chapter 3, verse... 13, if you're trying hard to do good, no one can really hurt you. Oh, we didn't do it because of fear. We did not submit to our authorities because they just might oppress us. We didn't submit to our owners because they beat us. We sure didn't submit to our spouse because (laughs) we just don't like them anymore. And we deserve better. They were different than when we first met them whatever reason. Submit as Jesus Christ submits. Suffer as Jesus suffered so that the world sees you as different, a new creation in Jesus Christ. If you're trying hard to do good, no one can really hurt you. Verse 14, but even if you suffer for doing right, you are blessed. Don't be afraid of what They fear. They. Because you're a new creation in Jesus Christ. Verse 15. Now we get to fishing. We've had fellowship. We've had... What did we have next? i got to look back. (laughs) I made my notes in my margin. We have called to be fishers of men, to let our light shine. And now we have fishing. I come to Awana, and I help wherever I can help. I prepare, I pray, and I find out it's a blessing to be being obedient, training up these children. And I may not see the fruits of my labor right now. I may not have a profession to come to Jesus Christ. 
You may have one later that down the road that says, thank you for that training that you gave me in Awana and everything. You might. You might have it when you get to heaven. I love that song. What's it? Somebody help me. Thank you. Thank you. Well, who's it by? I can't remember. Ray, Ball. Ray, I think it is too. Where he gets to heaven, he thinks he didn't do much in his life when he did Sunday school and everything else. And he gets one example, then he gets another example, and then he looks. And as far as the eye could see, because of that person fishing, and that person fishing, and that person fishing, that he built his life on Jesus, the building blocks. And there's the temple of God, this thing called the church, that will live eternally with God forever and ever and ever. And we're called to be fishers of men. The end of that chapter ends with the example of Noah. Ha, <laughs> Noah. Hebrews eleven seven. 7, that's my motto verse. Out of reverent, holy fear, Noah built an ark. And I love using this scripture for approved workmen. Because <laughs> if you study scripture, first thing I'm going to ask you is how long did it take to build the ark? And everybody's got their assumptions. Because they've heard a preacher say it. They've seen a movie do it, whatever. And it took Noah this amount of years. Scripture does not say. Come talk to me about it. It talks about when God came to Noah. It talks about when the time comes. Doesn't say when Noah started building. Doesn't say who helped Noah. Gives the dimensions of the ark and it's going to take a pretty long time. We don't know if his family even helped him or if they sat there ridiculing him saying, I'm not helping dad, this is stupid. We don't know any of those factors. All we know is God said, I am going to destroy the earth because of their wickedness. But I have found favor in you because you live righteously. And the New Testament tells us that he was a preacher of righteousness. I don't know what that means. I don't know if it was only by his actions obeying God, which seemed foolish in this world, or if he, the whole time he was preaching, he's just hammering. Hey, I don't know all about it, but, but, but there's a Savior coming one day. And I got hope. I don't know, as he was building that ark. I have no idea. He probably didn't even know what an ark was, a boat was. But I know what. He knew who God was. And he didn't fear it, mankind. He knew what God, who God is. He knew that God could save his family. Hebrews eleven seven. 7, out of holy fear, Noah built an ark, then there's a preposition which ties it together, to save his family. And you know who went in that ark? His family. If we build a life of ministry teaching children, there will be children who are saved for all eternity. God bought the animals. <laughs> we don't have to know the hows or whys. It doesn't even have to make sense. I, I told him that when he called me to preach. I said, this doesn't make sense. <laughs> but what a blessing he has given me by being able to do it. So what is the greatest commandment? You approved workmen. To love the Lord your God with everything. Heart, soul, mind, strength. Jesus added in mind. It was there in the beginning. He expounded on it. Because see, the world at that day was looking for philosophy as the way to be saved. So he added in mind. He also added in mind because the mind is the one that you need to get to change your way of thinking so you can be transformed. Because this... Ain't gonna, this ain't going to happen until this is changed by the Spirit. Because I'm going to continue to say, I don't have time. There's so many things in my life this year that, that i got to take care of. Next year will happen. I'm not trained. I will do it later. Jesus is calling you to fish today, tomorrow, the next day. So many times we need to ask Him to show us the opportunities that we're missing along the way. And that means that we need to deny ourselves of the time. That job may not get done today. I want to be all finished with all this. I totally want to be. And that's the first thing that, thought, that crossed my mind when, when Rose said, are we going out to eat today? It was. And I denied that thought and I said, yes, honey, we are. It's dinner because I've got to do some things first. It won't be lunch. But it will happen. And unless something drastically changed, it happened and it did happen. And it was wonderful. 
we got to spend a good time together before Chuck got back. <laughs> what is the Great Commission? To go. To train disciples. Train disciples. Train them to be approved workmen. Not just tell them about Jesus, but train them. That means it's going to take a little bit of effort. Paul took Timothy, and if you remember when Paul died, he was only writing to Timothy. The greatest church builder ever, and he was writing to one Timothy, one disciple, so that he wouldn't let the world spoil him. That he would keep his eyes fixed on the target. It tells us to start in our Jerusalem before we go out to our Judea and Samaria and the other ends of the world. So Awanas is how we're going to do that. And Jesus will return, Logan, I'm getting ready, to ask you about how you fished for men. I don't know if he's going to ask you any other questions other than that, but I know he's going to ask you that question. <laughs>